Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and I'm back. What do you mean you hadn't noticed? When, where have I been? Well, I've been on holiday for the first time since 2019, thanks to that big thing we're all trying to forget. Finally, we got to take the holiday we planned for 2020, which was road tripping down to Lake Garda in Italy. And if there's a better way of bonding and becoming friends with the car than a big road trip, then I don't know what it is. This was, however, an actual family holiday, not in a chance to make content. And bear in mind, the last few weeks and months, I've been working six or seven days a week and into the night as well. So it was nice to take a few days off and just not make any videos and do any actual work, which is for me fantastic, but for the channel, not fantastic. Looking at the viewing figures and everything else over the last couple of weeks with only a couple of pre-records to look at, Things have been pretty quiet on there. Anyway, I'm back and stuff's gonna start happening. So first of all, what was I doing? Well, yes, I was road tripping this thing through Europe and did I fall in love with it? Yeah, I don't know. In many respects, yes, it is absolutely fantastic. It is effortlessly comfortable. It's nice and quick on the motorway. It is a bit soft and wobbly at speed though, I've noticed, but that might be these winter tires it's still wearing. And in answer to the many comments I've had about why am I still wearing winter tires on my car when it's 40 degrees, it's because they're about 250 quid a corner and I just haven't had a thousand pounds spare to change them. Simple as that. Over the last two weeks, we've done 2,091 miles and spent 51 hours and 20 minutes in this car. And it's averaged 41 and a half MPG. As whereas it was doing, well, 600 miles on a full tank of diesel on the motorways when we were cruising, which is pretty impressive, I have to say, as we only had to fill up about, well, two, two full fill ups and a couple of small top ups along the entire time. Um, that's pretty impressive. It does look pretty filthy now as it just came back on the Euro Tunnel last night. We are bug splattered and dirty but thank you to the channel sponsor diamond bright the fact this thing is ceramic coated everywhere means that it will clean up incredibly quickly and easily despite the fact we've got a hose pipe band so if you want your car to come back from the brink of grimness then follow the link in the description below where you'll also find a 10 percent discount using the code fd10 and you can debug your car nice and effectively as well and i heartily recommend all of their products thank you for the sponsorship but it performed as perfectly as you would expect from a car like this. On day one, we cannonballed from the Euro Tunnel to Grenoble, which is in the mountains, kind of close to the Italian Swiss borders. And it's 566 miles, nine and a half hours in one hit. And the car was fantastic. And we all got out agreeing it was incredibly comfortable. We did a short stop in Grenoble where I should have had a thing called a Crit Air sticker, which is like their version of ULES, but only costs four quid instead of 12 pounds a day. So sometimes the French do get it right. However, they are very, very good at bureaucracy and it didn't turn up until, well, well, after we left. So we couldn't go into the city in the car, we had to park on the edge and get the tram in every day, which I guess is kind of what they want. However, the car continued to be excellent. Then we went through the mountains, drove through the Mont Blanc tunnel, which is about 10 kilometers underground. So the fact I've got cruise control again after the old 204 not having cruise control for the last few years was an absolute boon. So that again proved itself to be very, very good indeed. And finally, we made it down to Italy to Lake Garda to drive around some of the most beautiful roads in the world. And around, of course, the roads where James Bond knocked various Alfa Romeos into the lake in the beginning of Quantum of Solace. It did feel a bit wrong being in a German car, considering that chase should only really be Aston Martins and Alfa Romeos, but we make do with what we can.
and after a few days of enjoying incredible pizza, incredible wine, amazing views and all that kind of stuff, we headed home over the mountains, through Switzerland, and of course, over the Stelvio Pass. Now the Stelvio is a lot of fun, but one thing you'll find if you ever get to drive that place is just how busy it is. So no matter how you try and time it in your traffic, you're always gonna wind up stuck behind a slower driver, some cyclists, a bus, that kind of thing. So going up is brilliant, but frustrating. And in that, in that situation, the automatic didn't cause too many issues because we weren't really going that quickly and it was a lot of stop start. Turns out going down the other side of Stelvio is a far better road. It's faster flowing, more open turns, and lots more fun. And then the manual override thing on this thing is absolutely essential because you need the engine braking to be in second gear and third gear pretty much the entire way down. And I thought we were taking it pretty slow, but we were leaving a BMW with a very excited looking driver behind quite a lot. However, I don't know if it really is an automated manual on the 9G Tronic, but there's not a lot of engine braking. So even knocking it into second, you feel a bit of a, a slowdown from things. And then it kind of just speeds up again. And incredibly, even with those massive brake discs, by the time we got to the bottom of that, there was actually feeling like a bit of brake fade um, when we tried to actually stop the car. But that might just be that annoying automatic thing of the car still pulling forwards, even when you're trying to stop. And no matter how much I say, everything else on the car is fantastic. It's oh, supremely comfortable. The audio is amazing. The sat nav is really good. It's even got nice big pictures of, the, of landmarks and stuff on it. The headlights that go around corners, brilliant. Everything on the car is superb, but the gearbox did still wind me up. Go going around the lake roads, there are loads of cyclists who are constantly having to nip out and overtake them on very short stretches. And in eco and comfort, it just doesn't change down fast enough. It detunes the engine. So you're constantly going up and down the motor selector from comfort to eco to sport. You need sport to get past. And then one time I tried to overtake some bikes, went into sport, went to overtake, and the car just sat there, no power, no change down, just sitting on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> just so annoying. Anyway, everyone else thinks the car is amazing and comfy and lovely and they want to keep it. I'm still very much on the fence about the gearbox. I don't know what to do really. Whether to change the tyres, lower the suspension, get it remapped, or just get shot and get a Focus ST, or a Volvo, or a Mazda 5, 36. The interior of this thing really is every bit as good as I'd hoped it would be. The air conditioning is incredibly powerful with some 40 degree plus days. Um, it feels so good. These seats with all their multiple controls I mean you can find exactly the right position. Um, Mrs. Furious struggles on long car journeys, getting some real sort of 
back and leg pain, but none of that found a great position early on and was fine. Furious Junior used to get car sick every trip in the old W204. None of that problem in this car. He loves it. They both love it. The only thing that's not good is the lack of CarPlay. You can hook up your phone through the Bluetooth, that's fine, um, but you can't really control it particularly easily or well. It does, however, have lots of inputs down here. You can even play videos off the um, SD card down there and copy those to the hard drive. So when we were at Eurotunnel, we were watching videos on the main screen, which is pretty cool. This is the receipt for the uh, Mont Blanc Tunnel. 48 euros it costs to go through there. Uh, Fréjou Tunnel Mont Blanc. We didn't realize we were about to drive through that. Turned up, thought it was a border crossing and hand to hand over a credit card. That was exciting. And also incredibly long. It's quite exciting at first, but it gets pretty boring pretty fast. The dilemma with this car is that they all love it and want to keep it. I'm so not enamored with the automatic gearbox. I, I, I don't know, I'm very much undecided on the fence. Whether we keep it six weeks, six months, and another year or two, I honestly don't know. What I do know is I'm never going to replace it with another automatic as a daily. The only automatics I'll own from now on will be weird, unusual things. Or when we go to electric eventually or hydrogen, because it is the most unrewarding, irritating mechanism ever installed in a car. Never having another automatic, that is for sure. Everyone has said, oh, it's the best thing I've ever done. I don't know what you're on about. It's just annoying. So, so annoying. Anyway, right, moving on. Anyway, that's that car. What else have we got on the fleet? Because it's been a little while, and I like to every six months to a year, do a little roundup of what else are we looking at? In case you're new to the channel, what else are we looking at on here? So while we decide whether this car stays or goes, and if I do keep it or sell it, I've got to fix this thing. The one bit of damage it came home with was someone opened a door into the wing. I think it must have been a van or a lorry because there's white paint on here and it has chipped the paint and I'm really not at all happy about that. So let's look at the rest of the drive and give everything else at home and away a quick start up to make sure everything still works after a two week layup. And as I've not been over to the barn yet, make sure I still own it. The first car I think we will have a look at will be the newest arrival on the fleet. Did I disconnect the battery on this one? I think I might have done. So this is genuine post-holiday. Trying to make sure everything still works. Oh dear. Great, so the plant has grown up while we've been away and now I can't get through the gap to get back into the car. I had to lose the Panama hat. I'm a massive fan of the new Panama, which was a holiday purchase. I actually literally can't get into the car. That's really awkward. Right, eventually after being brutal with the plant, I managed to get in through the driver's door and because I'd locked on the remote, there we go, um, it wouldn't open the passenger door from the inside because it was deadlocked. Right, let's go and find the keys again. Uh, is the battery really low even though it's been disconnected? This is a scrapyard battery, it has to be said. Come on. Doesn't sound promising. Doesn't sound promising, so if I can get back in through. Oh, great. Well, that's super helpful. It's now half locked, half open. The joy of coming back after a two week holiday. Ah, oh, dead. Okay, jump starter. Okay, got the Noco booster thing plugged in, or the. No, it's just red light. Okay, see if anything happens now. That's better. Let's see if we can start this after a two week layup. It shouldn't have gone flat considering I disconnected the battery, which is the reason I disconnected the battery. Right, let's see how we go. There we go. The 1.8K series VVC springing into life. Excellent. So one down. I might bung this on charge for a little while, make it usable again so it doesn't leave me stranded anywhere. So this car has come a long way. If you've been following the story, you know it arrived. Blown head gasket, took the head engine apart. We completely rebuilt the entire top end. Head was skimmed, valve stem seals were done, um, new head gasket on there, water pump cam timing belt, the whole bit basically. Runs like an absolute champ. And look at this exhaust manifold on here. This thing is a, a, such a proper like, race spec bit of kit on a Rover 200. 
Uh, since then, the first time I used it, the radiator blew, so it's got a brand new radiator in there. Then the fan wasn't working, so it's got a second-hand fan. This car's really good. Problems with this car, basically, are the bodywork. It's been badly repainted on this wing, which has had a knock and it's cracked. Scraped on the front bumper. Let me show you that rear wing on the other side. A few scrapes on the back as well. So it basically needs bodywork sorting out, and uh, that's expensive and or time-consuming. So this is all quite a big hump in the side, whether I can be bothered to take care of that or not. Let's find a charger on this thing, I think. And look at the next one, see if that will start. The next one is the Alfa Romeo. So while this guy has got a um, second-hand scrapyard battery on it, this one has got a brand new battery on it, which has been on top-up charge disarm. <coughs> Sounds promising. Here under the bonnet of this one is the famous two-litre twin spark Alfa Romeo masterpiece of an Italian engine. Let's squeak ourselves around here. And, oh wow, it's warm in here. Neutral, immobiliser again, and yes, this one's awake, it's alive. This is always the worry after a couple of weeks away, you come back, nothing's gonna run. This one is a fantastic car. These things do rot badly. This one's had so much work done underneath it that it's now incredibly solid. Recently had camber water pump or that malarkey. New alarm immobiliser put into it. Just had a custom made exhaust done for it so it's sounding lovely and sweet. MOT passed and just on the way home from the MOT, a horn and one of the headlights has decided to stop working. There are earth issues which are also probably the reason the air conditioning doesn't work as well. If I'm feeling brave or rich I might get that looked at because the main reason not to use this car at the moment is basically it's just really, really warm. So, get the aircon running. This thing will be great on a day like today. Fantastic. This is a car that doesn't really need anything. I would quite like to lower it, put some better brakes on it, because something both these two 90s things have in common is they ride very high and the brakes are terrible. Improving that on both those cars would definitely be an upgrade. That one also needs new tyres. They're legal, but they're pretty ancient, and it would certainly improve the ride and handling. There's a few little spots of rust, just surface rust appearing that I need to go and get taken care of as well. It's just all money and time, but we'll get around to it. So this car arrived in, I think, the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, just before COVID. And it's a car I've had my own for a long time. I love these 145s and 6s. So yeah, whether I keep this car or not long term, who knows? Same with any of these cars, really. As much as I love them all, well, I've got them. I can't get other cars, so that one is definitely a car I'd like to be a keeper, but I know a previous owner would like it back. Likewise, a previous owner of this car would like it back as well. So if I do decide to part with any of these, I know I've got a safe home waiting for them. Right, next car, the Crown Vic. Let's see if the Vic will run. Right, the Crown Vic I know is a car a lot of people have joined the channel or just started following the channel purely because of. And it's a car I'd wanted for absolutely years. And looking back at their old holiday photos, I realized I've been taking photos of these things for about a decade before I bought one. This is an ex-Ohio detective's car. No central locking, at least not on the kit anyway, because it's an unmarked police car. Will it fire up after two weeks of doing nothing? Ching, 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 American car, ching, ching, ching. Let's see. Of course it will. A big 4.6 V8 just jumping into life with a massive American spec battery, which seems to have more lead cells in them or something. I don't know, they hold charge well. So this is the only car I've ever deliberately bought with an automatic transmission, um, really because they don't sell them without an automatic transmission. And um, yeah, it's kind of part of the character to use that big column shift thing. And uh, they are terrible as autos go, even by my low standards of opinion of them. This one is a particularly poor gearbox. In terms of work coming up on this car, it does need that gearbox uh, fluid flush. Someone suggested in an email the other day, I think called uh, the J mod, which I've read about in the past, which makes them just shift a bit more aggressively and actually change when you want them to. Um, I might get that done if I can find someone in the UK willing to do it. Like the uh, Alpha, it's got a couple of tiny rust spots that I need to sort out uh, before they become big rust spots. We'll do that over winter time when a car's not being used because it's been a long time coming. I've not had it too long, so I don't want to take it off the road for too long waiting for that. It is an ex-unmarked police car, so we need to have some unmarked police car stuff in it, I think. 
So a few lights and sirens and bits and bobs to make it a bit more policey would be a great addition to this car at some point in the non too distant future. I had to lose the Panama because I couldn't get it through the, uh, the gap in the hedge. Might go back to the Panama in a minute. But it is an absolutely fantastic car. I'm so glad I own this one. Yeah, this is the car I kind of had least worries about restarting after a two week layup. But look at the cobwebs and the dust on this thing. I guess we have plenty more Sahara and sand, rain and dust blowing over. So it was spotless when I parked it a fortnight ago. But again, this one has been uh, ceramic coated, so it will clean up very easily indeed. It does have a little problem every now and then. But the check engine light pops on. And that appears to be an issue with um, the fuel filler. Um, as the fuel level goes down, it creates a vacuum and that creates a a sensor issue of some kind. So um, you have to clear it and then refill it and it's not actually a problem, it's just a thing that happens every now and then. I don't know why. Now next up, one of two fairly serious projects here on the channel, and one which I admit and apologize, I have been neglecting. This is the W123. I know a lot of people did join the channel because they want to see it run. I want to see it run as well. I have got a new bonnet for this thing because this bonnet is slightly bent and they're kind of hard to correct. This is the four cylinder 2.1 I think it is. So ironically, very similar layout in terms of cylinders and capacity to the newer C-Class. This is the Bosch Cage Electronic I got working uh, a little while ago. I don't know what's wrong with the bonnet now. It was standing up quite happily on its own as it's meant to, but now it won't anymore. This hasn't been started for a little while and it won't today for the simple reason that's the batteries in the boot, because the scrappy old battery I got for it is too tall for the bonnet to shut. Do you want me to get the battery out of the boot and start it for you? Oh, go on then, I will. Yeah, scrappy old battery, not a great fit, but it does hold plenty of power, so it should crank this thing. Hopefully it won't fall down and bend the bonnet, although it doesn't really matter because I'm scrapping this bonnet anyway. Oh, lights on. Straight into life. That's why they call the W123 the best car ever built. It's amazing. I won't run it for too long because there's no water in the radiator. Oh, there might be water in the radiator. I genuinely don't remember. I have a fan on it anyway. Uh, it's mildly damp. I think I might have drained it because it was cold back in winter time. But there you go. That car, straight into life every time. That old Bosch K Jektronic, it's a real pain to get going in the first place, but once it's running, it's just flawless. I'll quickly show you my favourite thing on this car. Oh, there's quite a few favourite things, but this is my absolute favourite. <coughs> horn. Flick the button. <coughs> Other horn. Town and country horns. Isn't that cool? Oh, I think one of those horns might be a bit sick. Regardless though, it's got twin tone horns, which is brilliant. Okay, if you're unfamiliar with this particular project, this is a barn find it pulled out of an actual honest to goodness barn. Uh, made the engine work. I now have welded this front corner up, which now needs painting um, because that's all a bit grim. I need to replace the inner and outer arches on the back corner of this side. Then I need to completely rebuild the braking system on it because it has no brakes at all. And then I need to paint it. And I've got a new bonnet for it. I need to get a new wing for it. And this bumper's a bit manky as well. So there's lots to do. And someone's cut the wiring off the back of the headlights and my efforts to rebuild it haven't really worked. So there's lots to do. This is a fairly massive project. Uh, give us time, we'll get around to it. Right, finally, the last of our cars at home and the other major channel project is the V8 Rover, the 4.6 litre converted Rover P6, which is doing a sterling job as a table in here. Uh, completely rebuilt the engine, had the entire thing machined, crank was ground, fast road cam, uh, heads were skimmed, uh, it's got a ton, a ton of stuff on it to make it really, really good. Still running the original SU carbs, just where we're trying to start the thing. However, that's the one thing it won't do. And I don't know why. So I'd dearly love to start this car for you right now, but it won't. So it's just driving me mad. So whether I ship it off to a classic car specialist to say, just make it go or what, I don't know really with this one. Um, because I just want the thing to, to start and drive and just 
just go. Then we can move on with the project because I've got other big ideas for this car. Once it's actually working, there's lots more to do. Electric power steering, different fuel system, different gearbox, all kinds of other stuff just waiting to happen, but not until the damn thing runs. So yeah, that's an issue. Anyway, this is frustrating me as I'm sure it's frustrating you, but I really want to get on with this one and get it done as soon as possible. Right, let's see the cars that are not here at home, that are lurking around in the barn and off-site. Right, next up is our old friend, the Rover 2000, the car I've owned the longest out of any of my vehicles. It is a lovely vehicle and it actually turned 50 years old this year and I managed to completely miss that birthday. So sorry car, happy 50th. Um, I don't think it'll start because the reason it's currently in here is because the wiring on the starter motor has gone squiffy. So I can get a little click of the solenoid, but not enough juice going all the way to the starter itself. This car is fantastic. I've owned it since the early 90s, and it retrimmed oh, about 10 years or so ago. So these seats are fantastic. They're better than new. It's even got Wilton carpet down there. And it's a lovely, lovely car. I have got a new old stock door in here because the passenger rule I'm falling over, tripping over stuff, the rear passenger door over there has got some rust bubbling through and I was lucky enough to find a new old stock door. Um, I've also got uh, sun dim tinted glass in every window apart from that one because it didn't seem a lot of point in changing that panel over when I'm going to change the door as well. So yeah this is a lovely car which needs to get out very soon indeed. Runs really really well when it's actually running. In fact, it's the first car that was ever reviewed on this channel. So yes, yeah, so, sorry you haven't seen it in a little while. It's my favorite car as well. Uh, and there's a set of 18 inch wheels off the old W204, a car I do regret selling, but hopefully I've found a buyer for these wheels now. And those can be used to pay for inch replacement. Right, on to the next lockup, where there's another Rover waiting. So next up we have, Lockup number two, which contains a Rover 400, well, 420 GSI Tourer, which people keep forgetting I've got on a bit of spider webs, yuck. Ah, look at those webs I just put my legs through. Ah, I wish I'd worn trousers down there. Uh, people keep forgetting I've got this car, and do you know what? So do I, because I haven't seen it in absolutely weeks. I'm terrified to go in here now. The last time I came in, the monster sized spiders were in here were real arachnophobia specials. Ugh, gross. Right, okay, so let's brave the spider webs, get in it, pop the bonnet, actually the bonnet is already popped, reconnect the battery. Right, with the battery reconnected, it tends to take a couple of minutes to resync itself. We can go in with the key though. Let's see if we can fire this thing up. The, um, oh. Two litre T-Spark is a rather nice engine in this car. I'd actually say this car drives better than the um, coupe. Oh, immobiliser. No, nope, I have to wait a minute till it's decided to reset. There we go, it's working now. Do have to leave the battery disconnected though, as it does run flat otherwise. Straight away, a little bit tappy at the top end because hydraulic tappets and it's not moved for a while. But straight away, smooth as you like. This is a gem of an engine. This car is really, really good. What it needs though is a full respray. I think I'm gonna have a crack at doing this myself because honestly, it's a monstrous job that I really cannot afford to pay anyone for. Really is a nice car. Oh, the back tire's gone a bit low. Bring an inflator over next time I come. Interior on it is fantastic. Got the um, Silverstone half leather seats, same as in the 420 GSI Turbo Saloon that we uh, reviewed for the day. Nice bit of wood, nice leather steering wheel. Headlining is a bit wibbly wobbly. But this car does need a bit more attention from me, so the next couple of videos, certainly in the next week or two, we're gonna get over here, do a few jobs on it, and get this thing back on the road. But it's MOT'd and everything, I just need to put a tax on it and fix the brake lights and the indicators, pump up the tire, you know, stuff. Right, okay, this one is looking good. 
some people say don't start the cars, don't run them if you're just going to let them turn off again. But the thing is, with modern petrol, you kind of have to run the car every couple of weeks, otherwise it goes stale in the tank and in the fuel lines and it won't start. So you kind of have to restart them every couple of weeks. Thankfully, after, it's got to be a month since I fired this one up, all good. This car is excellent. This was a this was something of a rash impulse purchase. It was my second most recent car buy. And um, yeah, it was kind of, well, it's got an MOT to the end of the week. If you want it, you can take it now for a good price. Otherwise, well, you can't. So I did. And it's a cracking little car. Right, on to the barn. Well, I'm taking a slightly weird route over to the barn and it's a really weird camera angle as well because I've not brought a camera mount, I've just slung the uh, camera around the headrest so you may or may not be able to see anything. Uh, following a Range Rover with a very interesting number plate but it seems to suggest he likes cats. Um, anyway, yeah, driving the 200 VI again after two weeks of nothing but the new Mercedes, it's amazing how much more involving and entertaining a car like this is. You know, like a sub 500 pound car can just be so much fun. The only thing I'm not loving about this is basically the lack of air conditioning because it's a really hot day and that's something you really do notice in a car on a day like this, especially when you put the windows up so you can talk. But the old hydraulic power steering is lovely and tactile. The gear change, it just puts you in the moment compared to the automatic where you just drift along around the corners and not really much happens. And this thing really does grip and handle. It rolls quite a lot, but it grips and handles like nothing else. Well, interestingly, I was following a, um, an old Ford KA on the way over a few minutes ago, and that thing, that really went round a corner well. It does make me wonder why I haven't got a KA in the collection. Hmm, food for thought, eh? So finally, here we are in the barn. Here we have the last four cars in the fleet. That's 11 cars in total at the moment. <laughs> and it's always a massive relief after a holiday to come back to a sort of remote storage location to find out the door's not been broken off and everything is where you left it. The local ne'er-do-wells haven't forced their way in and helped themselves to anything. In this case, it's all as I left it, so phew. Um, so we've got the Freelander Hippo, which I need to get out on the road soon. We've got the Volvo, the Mini, the Tomcat. I did do a starting one of these cars uh, a week or two before we um, went on holiday, actually. So I know these should all run. And of course, Hippo, I was busy changing uh, his rear window. In fact, I've just realised I've left his door card in the boot of the 200 outside, so I can grab that in a second. So yeah, the plans for these cars in the future. This one, I kind of want to make it into an off-road camper, but the last owner wanted to do some more off-roady stuff on it, but realized it was such a clean example of a Mark I. He didn't want to mess with it. I'm kind of feeling the same way as well, because it is a really, really tidy example of an increasingly rare a soft roader, but it's got the chunky tires, so I think maybe I will just take it out for some light off-roading and maybe do a bit of camping and stuff in it because it will convert itself into a soft roader, off-road camping machine very easily indeed. Next up, we've got the Volvo, which is something I managed to get incredibly filthy again, despite not doing many miles. This has got a couple of rust spots and a couple of small dents, but nothing to actually worry about. I do need to fix the heated seats in it. Um, but generally speaking, it's a really good car. Unless I do something crazy like turbocharging or doing a massive engine upgrade because it's very slow. Um, it's, it's all good. This, these cars are generally a bit finished. Um, it does still look really massive. In isolation away from the Crown Vic, it does still feel like a really, really big car. Um, then we've got the Mini. Need to fix the aircon on this, so that's a paid for job. Oh, spider web. So many spiders. Um, this is again a really lovely car, which being such an early example, car 202 off the production line, I'm not modifying, I'm just keeping it mega nice. But I will take this out for a drive and a need to service. So I'll video in the next week or two, get this one serviced and back on the road, sort out this misfire. And our friend here, the coupe, really is a channel favourite. One I, I toy with selling every now and then, but people just seem to adore this car so much. And I've put a bit of money into it in, just, in the form of the wheels recently, but it's also got 
air filter, exhaust, upgraded brakes, upgraded suspension. It's a really cool car that is a lot of fun. So that's 11 cars in total. Should I start all these for you as well? I'll, but I'll do the wrap up and I'll film it afterwards because I'll not be able to breathe afterwards. Right, so starting with the one furthest away in the corner, the Mini. This car is so cool. If you're new to the channel, you might not know about this. This is car two I took off the production line. It's a Y-Reg pre-production car from the first few days of production. It's effectively a hand-built car with a flat battery. Oh, I'm crying it out. Right, I'm not quite sure how this has managed to acquire a flat battery whilst it's on trickle charge. Haven't had a problem with this car in a little while, but here we go. That's better. So as I saying, this car, I discovered these things were a thing when I was uh, working for Mini Magazine, Modern Mini as it was then, before it became Performance Mini, and we did a thing about these cars being 15 years old. Anyway, it's now 20 years old. 2001, in fact, this car is, is 21, it's had its 21st birthday. Honestly, I do find it kind of incredible that these new shape R50 Minis, these brand new for the millennium, versions are now 21 years old, 2001 to 2022. Astonishing. And I do still think they look absolutely amazing. Frank Stevenson, designer of these things, did a incredible job, really did. Yeah, that gets the uh, E10 fuel sucked through so it's not sitting in the injectors and going crispy. Anyway, behind it is the antithesis of the small, nippy, easy to get around traffic and have fun on a country lane mini, the Volvo 740. Big, boxy, relatively slow, and uh, well, it's a Volvo. This thing, I 100% guarantee, will crank into life. It's got a Volvo branded battery on it still which the last owner put on. Damn it, that's something I need to sort out one day. Central locking that locks itself. Neutral, always make sure they're in neutral. Amazing. This thing is fantastic, it is so comfortable. These seats are just absolute armchairs. They are heated, but both of them have stopped working now, which means I've got to take them apart, get in there and de-upholster them somehow, and then fix the broken elements, which is a job I don't really fancy. However, I suspect it's had problems before because that fuse box has melted down there, so perhaps I need a new fuse box in it as well. I don't know. I think that's a fairly common problem on these. Best £175 I've ever spent is what I always say. Bought this thing for a sub £500 cheap car challenge and just hung on to it. Never did the challenge because of Covid. Right, will you guess us all? And now we have our wedgie friend, the coupe. Front of this thing I'm pretty sure is where Skoda took their inspiration for their early noughties and so forth cars design. Now will this one fire up? Yeah, of course it will. Fantastic. Got a big Piper stainless exhaust. It does have a lovely exhaust note to it. Could do something similar on the 200 VI because that sounds a bit harpy compared to this. This car is enormous fun. It does need, I think, new bushes around the suspension because although the shocks and springs, well the coilovers basically, have been done, it just does feel a little bit loose, a bit raggedy in times. Also it needs the gear linkage sorting out because that's a bit floppity too. But otherwise, this is the car I used to call my lifeboat car because you could always just trust it to work. Every time you turn the key, it fires up just like that. It's a brilliant, brilliant car. So much fun. So as I said in the previous video about this car, I do need to get in and change the rocker cover gasket because it's leaking oil like crazy. And then do the, uh, the gear shift because that's no fun at all. Right, last car in here, Hippo. The hippo opens up, well, 
I was only working on Hippo a couple of weeks ago, so I was expecting as much. But while I'm here, I can save myself a second job. And these kind of things are always safer when they're in the car rather than lying around. This is the door panel from this rear side I was working on, which I took home and gave a really good clean up because it was manky as anything, pretty disgusting. And now it's lovely and clean. Ah, there we go, so, whoops. This is the wrong door. I actually didn't realize I'd taken off this door card and not put it back after cleaning as well. So I've got two door cards that need to go back on. And I do really need to clean up this entire car because it's filthy inside here. Well, there's a job I wasn't planning on doing this afternoon, but I'm glad we have now got it done. Both those door cards now refitted, looking significantly cleaner than they were when they came off. Ah, now completely refitted. Um, let's just give this thing a quick start up, just to show it does go. And then we'll call it a day and go home, edit this video. In park, because it's an automatic. Incredible. Shuffs into life. Bit smoky because it is an old diesel. But there you go, Hippo. Absolutely loving it. This thing's smashing it as always. I do need to go and update my boards because they are not quite correct anymore. MOT isn't due to January. Uh, Mark 250, that's June next year. Volvo is actually out of MOT. I'd forgotten that one. That one I do need to go and sort out and get out tested fairly soon, actually. Because, uh, yeah, that's, well, currently not MOT, basically. That one does need to get sorted out. Hopefully it'll just go straight through. I'll get that book this afternoon. I oh, can't, Sunday. I'll get that booked tomorrow. Right, meanwhile, Thank you, Hippo, for being well behaved as always. Do need to get Hippo on the road again. Into some mud, in fact. Hippo is too much fun not to be swamping through a forest somewhere. Brilliant fun car. So that is the channel as it stands at the moment. We've got two Mercedes, one Mini, one Volvo, one Ford, um, one Alpha. We also seem to have five Rovers, hang on. 200, 200, 400, P6, P6. Yeah, we've got five Rovers, which is more Rovers than any one person probably needs. But it's 11 cars in total, which is a lot. They all need things doing, whether it's a small thing that doesn't really make much of a video or a massive thing, which is very video worthy. But hopefully that's enough exciting content to keep you watching for the next few months at least. Oh, and I'm sure there will be more cars coming because there's so many amazing cars. I am very much a caraholic. There's so much good stuff out there that I don't get bored of cars but they do kind of get pushed to the back once they get done. Like the Volvo we spent a lot of time making videos about and then it was more or less finished. Now we use it, it's gonna to go to a couple of shows later this month, so it's still taxed at the moment, but we're gonna, yeah, we'll have this out at shows again um, and just use the thing. The problem really is storage and also the amount of money that's tied up in each individual car. So if I want another car, I kind of feel like I need to, to sell one to make space and for a bit of cash, but then I won't have that car anymore and I'll regret that. So there's other things I want, other sort of 90s hot hatches, uh, 1960s and 70s cars, which have the advantage of being MOT and tax free, which saves a fortune. Um, other off-roaders, I mean, this one, I don't want to mess around with too much uh, in terms of, you know, jacking up suspension, fitting a snorkel on the side, which was, my, my idea was to fit a side snorkel up the side of the A-post so it can wade through deep water. There's loads of stuff you can do to these things, but I don't really be hacking this one about, it's just too nice. So maybe we can find some slightly rattier off-roady thing and turn it into a proper off-road monster. Too many things to do, too many ideas. Um, oh yeah, I forgot about little friend on the floor. Um, yeah, my plans for trying to make a drive system using the upgraded motor just fell apart completely, didn't work even slightly. So I need to completely go back to the drawing board on how I'm motivating this machine because the original stuff that came out of these things, it's just so underpowered, it's not even fun. What I want is something silly. And that means doing something else. I haven't really figured that out yet, but I will. I will figure something out on this that's gonna need just making something from scratch basically. So, thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed a little look around. Well, first of all, the new Mercedes and my still lack of decision on whether that's a car I'm going to keep or not. I'm kind of half, 
half of me likes having a car that's really nice and comfy and you know, a bit smart and everything that you know can turn up in a hotel we stayed in in Reims. We accidentally managed to get an amazing bargain on a hotel we didn't realize as posh as it was. So when we turned up and we were parked in amongst a bunch of Aston Martins and other flash stuff, it didn't look out of place. Um, we did not pay the kind of money that hotel would normally be paid. It's uh, a bit of a bargain, accident, God knows how. Um, on the other hand though, it's not exciting and there's nothing to do to it. So maybe it'd be better to go and change it for something a bit more weird and different. I don't know. But that's a decision I've so far failed to make conclusively, along with the rest of these cars. I mean, the Mini I'm keeping because it's worth so much in the future. The Coupe I'm keeping because it's so much fun. Everything else, I just don't know. The only decision I have made for absolute rock solid certain is the Panama hat looks awesome. That's staying. Right, thank you for watching. As always, please do hit like and subscribe. If you've not checked out our channel sponsor, Diamond Bright, then hit the link in the description below because there's tons of good stuff in there for keeping your cars spotless and immaculate. And especially now we've got hose pipe bands, they've got a bunch of waterless wash as well, which makes life a bit easier. Oh, and if you like the look of the t-shirts and hats I've been rocking in these videos and other ones, then please do head over to furiousdriving.co.uk where there's a whole bunch of exciting and fun merch. So thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon with some other fun and exciting content. Goodbye everybody. Mm -hmm.